Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Jerry. I'm with Enhanced Vision. We're very happy today to present Dr. Bill Takeshta, who will be talking about visual aids that changed my life. If you have any questions, please hold them till the end of the webinar, and we will have a question and answer period where Dr. Bill will be happy to answer your questions. Right now, I'd like to turn the webinar over to our speaker, Dr. Bill Takeshter. Dr. Bill? Thank you very much, Chair. You to all um, very minutes that we have to today. What I to share with you my experience a person after interested in becoming a doctor. I full screening, and when the doctor couldn't believe, I remember the kids were playing bass. Let me out here, turned to bat. All was so clear. First home run that I ever hit. I told my dad and brothers, I become an eye doctor. Fortunately, they they really encouraged me to become an eye doctor because my family were all gardeners in the in the camps during World War II, and so it was really. To Dr. Samuel Janinski. Dr. Bill, maybe many of you. Dr. Bill, um, we're yes. having trouble. We're ha this is Jerry. We're having trouble hearing you. I'm getting a bunch of uh, questions, uh, comments from people. Is there any way you call in on your phone um, because the mic is not coming through right now? Oh, okay. There's no sound in. Okay. Oh, now now the sound is coming through let me, clearly. Let me uh, just one moment, please. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We're attempting to fix the sound as we speak. Just give us a moment. Thank you. Jerry, you can't hear me on this microphone either. Now I can hear you fine, Doctor Bill. Okay, but the other attendees still cannot hear me. I'm waiting to see if someone uh, can type. If they, if you can hear us now, would you please? Okay, yes. Now it's okay. Everybody's letting me know. So if we could start over, that would be great. Thank you, everybody, for okay. your great responses. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, and I'm over here in Los Angeles, so a lot of times technology doesn't work perfectly over here. So again, I want to thank all of you for attending this seminar today, and I want to share with you uh, my experiences of becoming blind and how the use of assistive technology really changed my life. Now, I first became interested in becoming an optometrist when I was six years of age after I failed a school screening. And when I received my first pair of glasses, I just couldn't believe believe how everything looked so clear and so big. And when my mother drove me home that day after picking up my glasses, the kids were playing baseball on the street, and I said, let me out here, let me out here. When it was my turn to bat, the ball was so clear and so big, I swung with all my might and I hit the first home run of my life. At dinner time, I was so proud, and I decided that I was going to become an optometrist. So I went on to UCLA, and I then studied as much as I could to become an optometrist. And during that time, I was introduced to Dr. Samuel Janinski. 
Dr. Janinsky that some of you may know, he is the person who actually invented the first closed circuit television. He was born with healthy eyes, but they put in the wrong concentration of silver nitrate and burnt up his corneas. But as he was growing up and going to school, he had problems because the teachers wanted him to behave like a blind boy. And he says, I don't want to behave like a blind boy because I'm not blind. I have vision. And he found a pair of binoculars in his father's closet, and he would use that to read the board. And he would hold the paper up to his nose to read. And he went on to get a PhD in applied mathematics and physics from Brown University and Harvard. Well, he later then established the Center for the Partially Sighted. And I did an internship there, and I just couldn't believe what was happening there. You see, I was working at Jules Stein also, and I found that there were so many people who even after surgery, they could not read, they couldn't drive, they couldn't walk, they couldn't work. And the ophthalmologist that I work for, he referred me to go and meet with Sam Janinsky. And what I saw, what the optometrists were doing, it made me realize that this is what I wanted to do. Fortunately, after I graduated from optometry school in 1987, Dr. Janinsky asked me to become one of the staff doctors at the center. And at the same time, I opened up my own private practice where I worked with children. And so for 17 years, I was really just in heaven being able to help these children and adults who had these very rare vision problems. And it was so exciting to see that people from all over the country and all over the world who had these vision problems would come and ask for our help. But unfortunately for me, I later then developed a retina condition called cone rod degeneration. I had a blind spot in my central vision and was forced to retire. And at that particular point in time, it was the hardest thing for me to do. You know, I, I loved optometry so much that I worked seven days a week. I couldn't wait to go and see what kind of patient was going to be there next that we could help. And when I retired, I really didn't know what to do. My friends were all at work. I couldn't drive anymore. I couldn't see well enough to go jogging or play sports. And I just became very, very angry. So for many of your patients who do have low vision, or some of you who are listening with low vision, I completely understand how difficult this condition could be. I got to the point to where I changed our phone numbers. I didn't receive any visitors. I didn't talk to anybody. I just sat outside in my backyard and I just stared off into space. Even when my wife wanted to do something kind for me, why don't we go out to the beach? Why don't we go out to lunch? I said, no, I don't want to. I was so embarrassed and I was so frightened that someone that I know might see me that I didn't want to go out. What if I tripped and stumbled over something? They would laugh at me. You know, it was my ego. I was so proud of being the doctor that I couldn't let anybody see me who I was. But it wasn't until I did attend a open house for my daughter's middle school, and I remembered that one of my patients who was low vision was the teacher for the visually impaired there. And I went to say hi. And he immediately grabbed my arm and took me throughout the class. He introduced me to all his students. He showed me everything that these kids were doing. They were doing electrical wiring. They were doing aquariums. They were doing drywall. They were learning to play musical instruments. I saw how they were reading and writing in Braille and using JAWS on the computer. And I said, my gosh, if these kids could do it, I should be able to do something. You know, I've been sitting at home for months doing nothing. And he said, you know what, I'm coming over to your house Saturday, and I'm going to show you how to do all these things. And I said, no, 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 that's okay, that's okay, I'm busy. He said, no, you're not. You're not busy. I know you're not. I see your wife nodding her head at me. She's telling me that we're not busy. So anyways, I attribute so much of my turn 
in life too, uh, Keith Christian, for showing me these things. And as I learned these things, it gave me so much confidence. And so today, I'm going to begin by telling you some of the most basic things about low vision. You know, it's very interesting that even though I was the chief of low vision at the Center for the Partially Sighted, and for 17 years, I helped people with low vision. I was not able to apply what I knew to help myself. So the first thing is, let's review how is it that a person is able to see. Most people understand that the eyes are critical for vision, but what a lot of people don't understand is that the eyes are merely receivers of light. In other words, they're like a light sensor, and they send electrical information down the optic nerves, which pass through the brain and make a crisscross, and it ends up in the very back of the brain. If there's any abnormalities to the eyes or the nerve pathway or the brain, we could have reduced vision. The first thing to understand, though, is that light is extremely important in the way that we're able to take in information. If the person has difficulty seeing, many people will simply turn on a light or they might read outdoors or get underneath the lamp fixture and that will greatly improve their ability to read. The reason for that is that this additional light will send more electrical signals to the brain and it helps us see more easily. When we increase the illumination, we could use different means to increase illumination. For example, we have desk lamps, we have floor lamps, and we also have new types of lamps that are often going to be positioned on a person's head. These types of lights are very tiny and they incorporate a LED light. The benefits of the LED light is that it provides a very bright light and it doesn't generate as much heat. When we use other types of light, such as the halogen light, it generates too much heat and it's very difficult for people to use. One of the lights that we find to be very, very helpful are these LED lights that have the ability to distribute a different color of light. When we think about a white light, we often just assume that a white light bulb is going to produce the same amount of light as another light bulb. But white light is made up of different colors of light, and we know that the blue wavelengths of light can be damaging to the tissues of the retina. So for many people who do have eye disease, the eye doctors will recommend that they use a lamp that does not have the blue light. Now light bulbs often will describe the color of the light in terms of the temperature, and it's denoted in degrees Kelvin. So if there's going to be a bulb that 2800 Kelvin, that is going to be a light that's going to be more so in the red reddish tint spectrum. There's other lights that are going to be in the 3400, others that are going to be in the 4000 degrees. The thing to remember here is that any light bulb that has a temperature of more than 5000 degrees has more blue light. So in these cases, it may be that you do want to choose a different temperature light. Or if this is the only light that's available for you, say, for example, at your job, and they will not change amount, you can ask your eye doctors to make glasses for you that will have a filter. And this filter will filter out the blue light. This particular lamp here is made by Berryessa. And this is a very good light for optometrists and ophthalmologists who see people with low vision because you could change the color of the light and the person can tell you which one is most comfortable and which one do they read the best with. Another feature that we have to consider in low vision is magnifying things. If we're able to magnify an object by either making it bigger or by us getting closer to it, it often makes it much easier for people to see if they have diseases such as macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. 
But there's also other types of diseases, such as retinitis pigmentosa or glaucoma, in which if you magnify things too large, it actually will reduce the patient's ability to read. So we want variable magnification when we're trying to evaluate and to help our patients or the person with low vision. Now magnifying glasses are one of the most common types of visual aids that are used. I know that for myself, I made myself all sorts of different types of magnifying lenses. Sometimes it was where I would have a magnifier in a bifocal, other times I would use a, a pocket magnifier. All of these different types of things had different functions. So depending on what the activity the person is trying to do, the doctor may recommend magnifying glasses or it might be that they recommend magnifiers. Within the magnifiers, we know that there's many, many different manufacturers of magnifiers. Some of these magnifiers are made in different countries and some of them are absolutely terrible. The quality of the lens is such that it actually blurs what you're trying to look at. But there's many others that are very high quality and many of them will have the LED light that we talked about. Some brands will even have lights of different colors. So after the doctor has determined that this person sees best with this color light, we can get a magnifier that will have that color LED bulb. The range of magnification generally ranges from about two times to 14 times when it comes to these types of magnifiers. I had many magnifiers, but what I found was that as my vision worsened, I needed more power. And as I needed more power, the size of the lens became smaller and smaller. And it became so frustrating because when I tried to read, I was only able to see maybe one or two letters at a time, and it gave me a severe headache to try to read with these. Another feature about the visual system is that when a person has an eye disease or damage to the optic nerve or to the brain, they often lose contrast. As a result, if you write something in pencil, a person with low vision cannot see it. Or other times, if a person is trying to walk down some stairs and they're all concrete, they won't even see the stairs because it just looks like a, a gray ramp. So we want to incorporate contrast. One of the things that you find to be very helpful is that if you are trying to identify your medications, if you put the medication against an opposing color background, if you have a white aspirin pill and you pour the aspirin onto the counter which is white, it could be very difficult to see that aspirin at all. You may not even know that it's there. But if you were to use a colored material such as a black piece of felt or any type of black cardboard, it would make it so much easier for you to identify your medications. Another thing that many people don't remember is that people who have low vision have difficulty just performing daily activities. Trying to find an electrical outlet to plug the vacuum cleaner in could be so difficult one of the things is that we could use contrast by using a colored outlet cover. The colored outlet cover, it doesn't require that a person has really strong visual acuity, but if you can see these different levels of contrast, it could be very helpful. Similarly, if you have stairs that are coming up into your entry level at home, you might paint a stripe on the edge of the riser and the runner so that that contrast will make it much easier for a person to see those types of stairs. One of the things that I have also found to be very helpful for myself is that my wife and I, we always dreamed of having a, a nice clean house and we wanted to have you know white floors and white walls and white furniture and when I became low vision, I can't tell you how many times I was running into the corners of walls and cracking my face open and such. Well, one of the things that we found is that when a person has low vision, even if it is bright, we still need to add contrast. 
So we started to use more colorful pillows. And at the edges of the corners, we would put some hardwood staining so that we had crown molding. And even at the door gems, what we did is that we painted the door gems darker brown. And it really gave it a very nice look to it, too. But it was something that allowed me to locate where the door itself is. Now for reading, for most people, most people with low vision, with macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, retinitis pigmentosa, one of the things that people often say is that they have a hard time reading books because there's not enough contrast. When they read the print where there is a black background with white letters, this is one of the easiest ways to increase their functional reading. Now this is something that you can't easily do with a magnifier or with a pair of glasses. But with this video magnifier, you could change the colors of the background and the text. And this is something that could be extremely, extremely helpful. For me, after about a year, when I was using all of these visual aids, I just realized I can't read anything anymore. And that was a time that I decided that I'm going to purchase a CCTV. I purchased a CCTV that had the best features with this type of a reverse background and the high contrast. And with this particular machine, it really, really opened up my life. With this machine, I was able to continue to serve as an expert witness in all of these different lawsuits. And if I didn't have this machine, there would not have been a way that I would be able to examine all of this evidence. Another thing that's very helpful and you can give to your patients who are low vision is to give them information as to how to make it easier for them just to see what they're writing by using a bold felt pen, or using paper with bold line paper, or giving them sample checks so they could go to their bank and get bold line checks. A person with very low vision would be able to continue to write. I know that for myself, I found the uniball lens, excuse me, the uniball pens to be very, very helpful for writing. I liked this particular type of pen because it was bold, it was a, a roller ball, so that when I did write checks, it would go through the carbon copy and I would not have to write it again. But there's other types of pens and pencils that are thicker and bolder that could be very, very helpful. Glare is another major concern for almost all people with low vision. We talked about how people with low vision need more light, but I could also tell you is that if it's just too bright, they cannot see. If you take them outside and you go to the beach where it's very, very bright on a white sandy beach, they just cannot see. I remember that was one of the things that my wife and I did. We decided that we were going to take our family on vacation. We had never been to Hawaii. We went to Hawaii, and when we got off the plane, the first thing I notice is that Hawaii is so much brighter than Los Angeles. Now, I live in the San Fernando Valley where it is very bright, but there's something related to the atmosphere, the position of the sun, it was so much brighter. And we went to the beach. It was literally to the point where I was blinded. I just could not see unless I wore different types of glasses. Now another thing that we take into consideration if we do have low vision is that there's many tools now that have sound. We have talking watches. We have talking alarm clocks. We have computers that will talk to us. Even with our cell phones, if we have an iPhone or the Android phone, we could simply talk to it. We could say, Siri, what time is it? Siri, what's the temperature? Or we could ask it a question and it will find those answers for us. So the technology that's available for us in audio format is extremely helpful. So as a result, many people who have severe low vision but have not really mastered reading and writing Braille could still function very effectively by using technology that has sound. 
So one of the things that I really strongly recommend that you tell all your patients with low vision, or if you have low vision, is use your eyes. Go ahead and use your vision. There are many times that people think that if they use their eyes more, it's going to wear their eyes out. But the reality is it will not happen. If you use your eyes more and more, that does not cause the tissues of your eyes to become worse. But in many ways, as you're using your vision more when you have low vision, it actually allows your brain to process information differently and much more effectively. For example, for myself, as I was beginning to lose vision, it was very difficult for me to read. But as I continued to fight on and read more and more, and I set a goal of reading five more pages of large print books each day, it became to the point that my brain was able to identify these letters and words much faster even though there was a blind spot right in the center of the word. I was really surprised at how my brain was able to fill in that missing information. The same thing holds true is that when you have low vision, your depth perception is often very poor. Pouring a glass of water could be very, very challenging when you have low vision. But as you continue to perform these activities, your brain learns different ways to judge cues and you're able to perform these tasks much easier. So go ahead and use your vision, but go ahead and also give yourself breaks if your eyes are getting tired. Hmm. Uh, Jerry, I don't know what's happened to my computer here, but it's not reading this slide. Would you read that slide for me? Yeah, it's the Pebble HD, Doctor. Okay, thank you. So. One of the most effective video magnifiers to buy is the Pebble HD. This is a pocket handheld video magnifier. And the reason that this was so much more effective for myself was that it has a range of magnification. It has the ability to change the colors of the background and the text. And it also is in very high contrast. So. In contrast to the magnifying glasses I had, the magnifiers that I would use would only have one level of magnification. Let's say that it has a 4x magnification. But there are certain times I'm reading something that I need an 8x magnifier. With a Pebble HD, you have that ability to change the level of magnification, and this makes it much easier for you to perform those types of tasks. Now the Pebble HD is very, very effective in the sense that it could be put in your pocket very easily. It's very effective if you're going to read things at the store, or it's also very effective if you're reading things in the office. It has a foldable handle that makes it very easy to hold, and it also is run on rechargeable batteries. What I liked about it is that the battery life was very, very strong, and it was very, very easy to use. Another thing that I found to personally be very interesting about using the Pebble is the fact that when I brought out the Pebble and used it in public, it was where people asked me questions, where did you get that? That is what I need, or that is what my mother needs. You know, my mom is trying to use a regular magnifying glass and it's not working. I was initially concerned that people would stare and look at me by using this, but this actually brought very, very positive type of attention, and I was able to refer people so that they would know where they were able to get it. Now, another type of video magnifier is called the desktop video magnifier. Many times if we're at home and we want to try to cook and we're reading recipes, it's something that could be very difficult. Or even though that the pebble would work well, it also is a little bit awkward because if I'm holding the magnifier in my hand, I don't have two hands free. So with a desktop video magnifier, such as the Merlin, I could place the recipe cards underneath the camera and it would be displayed in high contrast 
in magnification on the screen and it would make it very easy for me to try to do this different types of cooking. Now with the Merlin HD Ultra, this is a desktop video magnifier. It has a high range of magnification and it's also available in screen sizes where you could buy different size monitors based on your needs. What I really liked and the reason that I purchased the Merlin for myself was the fact that the screen, it tilts forward and backwards and left and right. This was something that was really very important to me because I was doing a lot of expert witness work with lawyers and when I was going to examine something or show the lawyer something, I could swivel the screen over in front of them and they found it to be very helpful to see and look at things through the screen as well. Now the Merlin comes with a XY table which slides up and down and back and forth very smoothly. So when I am reading a textbook, I could put the book on there and it slides very, very smoothly. The Merlin also has a very, very powerful autofocus camera. Now is this particular slide here talking about the Sony camera? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, I apologize. I'm not certain what's happening with my computer here, but uh, the Merlin does come with a Sony color autofocus camera. All of you are familiar with Sony and the high quality of their cameras, but this really just shows you how high of the equipment and hardware that is being used in these machines are. What I have found is that the cameras of the Merlin and all of the enhanced vision cameras, they focus very quickly and very sharply without that type of lag. Now, the Merlin HD Ultra, this is a version of the Merlin which has the high definition, it also has the large range of magnification, and what's also very unique is that it does have the ability to change the colors of the background and the text. I had mentioned how you can set it so that you could have a white background with bold black print. Now for a few types of patients that works very well, but more people prefer if you have a colored background and it could be a black background and you could have green letters or a black background and yellow letters but you could also have a blue background or a green background or whatever color background that you want and the Merlin will be able to demonstrate that to you. So this is why it's very important also as a doctor that you're going to measure the patient's color vision as well. And what's this slide here, Jerry? More on the Merlin, it just talks about the different size monitor, the magnification up to 73 times. Okay, great, now, thank you. And now the next slide is the Merlin Elite with the OCR. Now this is the latest version of the desktop Merlin and it is called the Elite. One of the things that is extremely beneficial about the Merlin is the fact that it does have a model that would be able to scan the text, the entire page of text, and read it aloud. It has all of the other video features to give you that magnified, high contrast, clear image. But if you do want it to read to you, this is fantastic. You could place your document under there. It will then take a picture and it will read it aloud to you. You have the ability to change the voices. And this is very, very helpful, especially for students or people who are doing a lot of reading because there's times that the eyes may become tired or maybe you want to multitask. I know that for myself there would be times that I would type notes on the computer while the computer voice synthesizer of the Merlin is actually going to read it out loud. And is this the Acrobat? No, this is still the Merlin Elite. It just talks about the HD and it comes in a 24 inch high resolution HD so it's just talking about what you just explained, Dr. Bill, so you could jump forward on this. Okay, thank you. And now we're in the Acrobat. Okay, now the Acrobat is really a very, very effective tool. And 
at the Center for the Partially Sighted, this is actually the most popular type of video magnifier at this point in time. The main difference between the Acrobat and the Merlin is that this has a camera that is a focusable camera that will swivel to look at something far. It will look at something that's on the table. And you could also swivel it to look at yourself. So people like this so that they can go ahead and comb their hair, do makeup. But students love it because they could then focus it on the board so they could see what the teachers are writing. They could then swivel it down at the book that they're reading or the notes that they're taking. And this is something that really has allowed students and employees to have so much more independence. As you could see, the distance between the camera to the tabletop, it's quite large. So many people who are working on things, such as their welders or that they're solderers, they have actually used this particular device to help to assemble and to build computers or other people who are doing different types of arts and crafts have been very, very happy with it. And this is just more about the Acrobat, Dr. Bill. Okay, so this might be talking about how it does have the uh, Sony color oh, autofocus camera. Yep, go ahead. Now you're on it the does right. This is what slide? This is talking about the Sony and the size as it comes in. Okay, yes, it does come available in different size monitors. And now it's on the, the new DaVinci. And this is the latest version of the Acrobat. This particular version called the DaVinci it has the incorporation of the optical character recognition. So in other words, in addition to giving the student or the employee the ability to see PowerPoint presentations on the board or books and documents at their desk or looking at their face, it also has that ability to read things aloud. This has been so incredible. And this year, uh, it, it's been really, really great because the camera it will take a picture and read the entire page of text. Now the reason I say that's very important is that there's other models of video magnifiers that do have the ability to take a picture and read text, but they do not read the entire page. And the ability to read the entire page makes things much more efficient. And this is just talking about the features of the DaVinci Pro. Yeah, I'm very sorry, everybody. I'm not certain what's happened here to my uh, computer system. But Jerry, as I go from each slide, would you tell me what the title is then? Sure. This is talking about the Sony HD autofocus camera, the DaVinci Pro, and um, just kind of the uh, different viewing modes, you know, the color changes, so what you've talked about previously. Great. This is Transformer. Now, the Transformer is another video magnifier that I purchased. This is really very, very helpful. For myself, there were many times that I would attend lectures and seminars, but I could not see what was on the screen. I could not see the PowerPoint presentations. So what I did is I purchased the Transformer, and this consists of a very small, compact camera that I was able to plug into my PC computer. I could swivel the camera to look at the PowerPoint slides, and I was able to take pictures of it. I could also swivel the camera so that I could read the handouts or the books I was looking at, and you could also use it to focus on different distances or yourself as well. Uh, the transformer also has the ability to change the range of magnification. You could change the colors of the background of the text, and this is a, a device that runs very, very effectively on the batteries of the laptop computer. And again, just more on the transformer about being oper battery operated. You know, Jay, I wanted to ask you, um, is the transformer still available with its own monitor if a person doesn't have a laptop computer to use? Yeah, we have a portable, a 13.3 inch portable monitor that can be 
bought along with the transformer. Also, it works on the monitor itself, works on batteries as well, so you don't need to plug it in. So completely portable. Wow, that's great. That is great. And is this the Amigo? Yes, the new Amigo. Okay. Now, the Amigo, many of you might be aware of the Amigo, but Enhanced Vision has released a newer version of the Amigo. And this has a screen that's seven inches. I say it's very similar to that of the size of a videotape. And what's really great about this is that it's very easy to carry. It has it comes with two batteries that you could just pop in there. So you have a very long battery life. But it's also very, very good if you want to be reading outside of your home. You know, many people think that the desktop video magnifier is extremely beneficial, and it is. But there's so many times that you're going to be at a meeting and you can't carry that big video magnifier. But with the Merlin, excuse me, with the Acrobat here, you could take this to different locations. And I remember when my vision became even worse, the judge was very surprised when I pulled out the Acrobat to be able to read some of my notes in court. Another really nice feature about the Acrobat is that you can connect Amigo, it to... Dr. Bill Amigo. Pardon me? You're saying Acrobat, but you're talking about the Amigo. Oh, I'm sorry. The Amigo. The new Amigo. Another feature about the Amigo is that the Amigo can be connected to a television or to a larger monitor. So what's very nice about this is let's say that you do travel to a friend's place or maybe you're going to help another person with homework. One thing that you could do is you could take your Amigo, plug it into a larger monitor or a television, and they would be able to see what you're seeing at the same time. This is something that's very, very helpful, and many people really enjoy it if you're going to show family vacation photos or you're going to do different work together. The Amigo, it has the ability to change the colors of the background and the text, and it is also uh, a, a device that has extremely, extremely high contrast. And again, it's just the Amiga. I'll talk you more about the Amiga. Was it? And then. Okay. I, yeah, there you go. Okay. Now this slide, I'm I'm getting text read to me again. So, okay. uh, one of the things that we say is about learning to use these visual aids. These devices are very very easy to use. I think that for most people, they could learn to use these devices by themselves in a very short period of time. However, when you do have a vision professional show you other features, it really makes things very, very quick and very easy to use. For example, one of the devices that we had talked about was the Acrobat or the Da Vinci, the one that is able to swivel and to focus on your face. Well, if you want to do your hair, and let's say that you're blonde or you have gray hair, and the wall in your bathroom or the wall in your bedroom is white, it's very difficult to see the silhouette of your hair. Well, you could simply put a colored towel on the door or on the wall right behind you, and you have that type of contrast that makes it much easier for you to see what you're doing there. Other things is that there's other different types of tricks that can make it much easier for you if you are a student and you're going to be taking notes. For example, many students will use these video magnifiers to see what has been written on the board, and they try to write their notes. But these devices also have the ability to take an image of it. So you don't necessarily have to draw every diagram or write every note. You could capture images of it and then later manipulate it and read it at a later time. So the different Distributors and eye doctors, they will provide this particular type of training. And we also are finding that in many low vision clinics, the occupational therapists are also becoming trained in using the technology, and they are actually providing this type of training. The interesting thing about the occupational therapist is that 
they are also able to bill for their service time and this is a way that the patients don't have to pay extra for that type of training. We also recommend that you become familiar with many of the other types of resources that are available in the community. In almost all communities, there are going to be agencies, chapters such as the American Council of the Blind or the National Federation of the Blind, the Council of Citizens with Low Vision. And when you find these different agencies, these are places that you can refer your clients to. I know that for so many of our clients, the thing that helps them to become open to receiving help in low vision is when they attend support groups. We have them come to a luncheon and we allow them to meet and mingle and when they find out that they're not the only ones and they hear that all the other people who are there have the same sort of problem, it makes them feel more comfortable and they learn. They learn from the other people in these support groups how they have overcome it to enable them to do that as well. So for more information related to any of these enhanced vision products or other low vision services, you could contact Jerry. And Jerry, you want to give your contact information? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Um, the easiest way to reach us is at 888-811-3161. And we have our low vision tech people ready to answer any questions. But if you have any questions right now, you can type them in and we can get them answered for you. So thank you, Doctor. That was a great webinar, and I'm waiting um, to see if we have any questions. And the first question is, um, I'm going to read this for you. Doc. What do you suggest a less than 10-year-old take with him to school? Um, so, Dr. Bill, can you answer that question? What yes, you... this, this is a 10-year-old student? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, yes. Well, I think that the first thing is that the student really must have a functional vision assessment so that we understand completely what are his or her visual strengths and weaknesses. But for most students that are going to be at that age, 10 years, there's a lot of activities in the class that they have to look at the board. They also have to look at their books, and they also may have to look at projects that they're doing. I would say that the Acrobat is something that is very, very effective because it is one of the more portable types of devices. In other words, it could be moved from one location of the classroom to another. It is also something that gives a high range of magnification. And if you do find that for some reason this student really would benefit from having the speech we would recommend the Acrobat version that is called the Da Vinci. Right, and that, that is, comes um, in a wheeled case, but if he has to transport it every single day, then I think probably the transformer would probably be the best if he has to carry it every day. You know, hopefully he can, has a place where he can leave it at school, because that's hard for a 10-year-old. Don't you Yeah, generally, Ten-year-olds are still in elementary school, and we do a lot of work with the Los Angeles Unified School District, and we have found that all of the elementary schools have been very, very supportive in allowing the students to keep the acrobat right in the classroom so that the kids don't need to try to take it back and forth from home to school. In other cases, too, we have also found that the school districts have provided the students with a second one for home. Right. Um, next question, are any aids for drivers? Um, as far as I know, there are no electronic magnifiers for drivers. Dr. Bill, do you know anything about people that want to still drive? Yes, we have that question every day at the Center for the Partially Sighted. And there are no electronic video glasses that are allowed to be used for driving. But if a person does have low vision, there are glasses that have a small telescope in it called a bi-optic telescope. 
and these are allowable for driving. The key features here is that the bi-optic telescope must be a telescope that is not focusable. In other words, the DMV doesn't want the person to be trying to focus it as they are driving. So they want something that has a steady focus. And in each state, the rules are a little bit different as to what requirements are necessary for one to drive with a bioptic telescope. Right. Um, someone's asked, what is the best portable near-far distance device with its own screen? So the best portable device, I think, is our Amigo HD, because that will let you look at street signs and and for um, if you're going to use it for, for shopping or restaurants, then I think the Amigo would probably be the easiest one that can do both near and far distance. Um, yes, I would agree. You know, it is so lightweight. It has long battery life. It has a lar you know, fairly large screen at 7 inches. And it is truly something that somebody could take wherever they go. When we look at students also, the Amigo is so effective if they're going to go to the library. It's very easy for them to carry up and down the stacks to find books and such. Right. Now, someone has a question, and it says, can you please address whether insurance sometimes cover these devices, including Medicare or other ways to fund? Um, I'm sorry to tell you that at this time, Medicare does not cover any of the products. If by any chance you're a veteran, uh, the VA will cover uh, the products based on income, so I can't get into all the different stipulations, but if you are a veteran, please go to your local VA. They can help you with that. And then as Dr. Bill had spoken about, I'm going to let him talk about this, there are organizations in the community that might able, be able to provide some financial help. Go ahead, Dr. Bill. Yes, most states will have what's called the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. And the Vocational Rehabilitation Department will help those people generally from the ages of 16 years to 64 years. And if a person with low vision needs assistive technology to help him or her to earn a degree that's going to lead towards employment, or to perform that employment duty, uh, we have found that the Department of Rehabilitation is very, very supportive. When there are children who are under that particular age, we find that the school districts are very, very supportive in helping the children to receive the devices that they need. The areas that makes it a bit more difficult is if a child attends a private school at least in the state of California, a child who attends a private school will generally not receive any kinds of support from the public school district. But we do have other agencies here in California. For example, one is called the Change a Life Foundation, which has been very, very helpful for people who don't have those other types of resources. Another thing that you may also do is that you may also contact different eye doctors who do low vision or it could be contact enhanced vision because there are sometimes that people pass away and they donate these video magnifiers and they want them to be used by specific types of clients. Right, thank you Dr. Bill. Also if you go to our website www.enhancedvision.com. We have a low vision resource page by state. So if you click on the low vision resource page, you'll see all kinds of uh, state and local organizations that can help you uh, with the purchase. So we have another question that I think is very interesting, Dr. Bill, and the question is, are occupational therapists being trained to work on learning low vision devices with low vision students, or is this happening only with adults? Very good question. Well, that's a very good question. I, I am not completely certain as to 
what is the specific education that occupational therapists receive in occupational therapy school. But I am right. very aware that there are many seminars that are being presented throughout the United States, generally by low vision optometrists and some low vision ophthalmologists that are very, very well attended by the occupational therapists. Now many of these occupational therapists are working under the auspices of these low vision doctors. So many low vision clinics and low vision centers, they do hire occupational therapists. Let me give you an example. The Center for the Partially Sighted, where I work, we do have occupational therapists who do work for us and they do provide independent living skills training to teach them how to perform activities of daily living. But they have also received training in terms of how to teach a person how to use these types of video magnifiers. So at our clinic, it is basically where the person might receive training from the occupational therapist, the optometrist, or the interns. We have interns from the optometry schools, so it might be any one of those different options. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Um, if you, I have a request to repeat the phone number to enhance vision, and that is 888-811-3161. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free. Um, at the end of the webinar, they're going to ask you some questions, and if you have any uh, want us to give you a call, just uh, let us know and we'll be happy to do it. So at this point, I want to thank Dr. Bill very much for all the information, very interesting you provided to us, especially coming from someone himself who, who is low, low vision. So it gives everybody a great perspective. And uh, Dr. Bill, any closing statement that you'd like to make? Yes, I would love to. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, you, Jerry, and Enhanced Vision for putting on these types of seminars because there are so many people out there in this country who don't know what this type of technology can do for them. And what I have learned of all the years of being in low vision, I've been in the field of low vision for almost 30 years now, there are so many times that patients say, I can't afford this. I don't want to spend $400 on a pocket video magnifier. But after they have it, after they use it, it changes their life tremendously. So it's very important to encourage your patients or yourself to try these devices. Actually try them and you'll see how it really makes a difference and it makes your life so much more enjoyable. So thank you very much, and I apologize about the technical glitch. Oh, that's all right. This is our first one, Dr. Bill, so, you know, these things happen. I, 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 I forgot that you'd be using a reader, so the reason it didn't pick it up because they were logos, so they were pictures as opposed to being written words. So my apologies as well, and my apologies out there. Um, I have many questions of people who would like to uh, receive a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, if you can email me at marketing at enhancedvision.com, so that's just marketing at enhancedvision.com, I will send you a link to the uh, PowerPoint as well as a link. We recorded the entire PowerPoint as well, so we're happy to share that with you. Again, thank you all for participating. We appreciate your interest. And everyone, have a wonderful day. Again, thank you, Dr. Bill. It was fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye.